Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is best-selling author Doug Marlette. Doug's latest book is Magic Time. Thank you for being here, Doug. Glad to be here. We should mention as an aside that you're also a Pulitzer-winning cartoonist. <laughs> That's right, my day job. Your day job. <laughs> what cartooning skills carry over into your novel writing? Um, you know, I think probably uh, the whole uh, training for uh, decades now of uh, distillation and 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 uh, I try to write towards uh, the emotion or the, the and the image. Uh, the, mm-hmm. You know, when you mm-hmm. do cartoons and and political cartoons, especially, it's you know the ideal, uh, the hole in one. There mm-hmm. is a wordless image. I mean, and so uh, the whole game. Uh, of it is to distill, to get rid of words, excess words, and to get a, things across. And, and the charged image mm-hmm. is what it is. You know, the, word, the, the definition of caricature is uh, from the Italian caricare, which means uh, charged portrait. And I think mm. really all nice. all novels, all all art, really is a kind of a charged portrait of something. And that so I write. I find myself uh, writing visually. I'm, I'm drawn to to strong images mm-hmm. or, or or charged situations, co- conflict, uh, striking situations, and and uh, I just I think I've developed an instinct for. For those situations, and and I kind of create them. I, I I try to write scenes that I would like to see. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you do very very vividly. You only began novel writing a few years ago. <laughs> That's right. Is this something you always knew you wanted to do, or did you have a road to Damascus experience? Uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, I didn't know that because I spent most of my twenties and thirties trying to learn how to draw effective political cartoons. But uh, after I was had done that for a while. My trajectory has been going from that single image to uh, multiple mm-hmm, images in mm-hmm. a comic strip. You know, I'd, I'd drawn political cartoons for 10 years, started the comic strip Kudzu, which is more, you know, multiple images and more character, uh, narrative, story. Uh, and then I started writing plays and musicals and screenplays, that kind of thing, and then ended up writing novels. I, I did not aspire to be a novelist. Although in my comic strip, Kudzu, which mm-hmm. I started 25 years ago, in the first week of the strip, the character of Kudzu, which is kind of based on my child, my adolescence in the <laughs> South, uh, wanted to be a novelist. Uh, the, he wanted to be a writer, and uh, that's that's the whole drive for him. But I did not know that I, personally, I had this character kind mm-hmm. of prophesying that for myself. Your debut novel, The Bridge, just got superb reviews. How did you get so many things right with your first book? You know, I don't, you know, it's so funny. I, I don't really think of all of these things as different. It all is trying to express something that you see as well as you can. It's just using different tools and, and different uh, things. And, and so I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I was just trying <laughs> to, you know, it's, the, it's that old, it's, I'm a primitive, I think, about everything. It's the same with with cartoons is that I the old joke about uh, about carving uh, doing a sculpture of a rabbit and you cut away everything that doesn't look like a rabbit I mean that's basically you know <laughs> cutting away the getting out of the way moving you know I, you write uh, first drafts that are not very good and and then you try to make them better and you try to take away the things that make them bad uh, and so it's a kind of a painstaking. The first thing I noticed about writing uh, in long form mm-hmm. was it was not uh, romantic. It was not all the things I'd read. You know, I'd read for years about writers and writing and sure. how they work, and all. And I'd watch shows like this show and 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 listening. And, and I projected onto it uh, from my great love of of fiction and novels uh, over the years, a, a, a kind of romance about mm-hmm. it. And the first thing I noticed was how it was not romantic at all. It was like more like bricklaying than, than that and, and making, you know, struggling to make subjects and verbs agree, you know, the basic mm-hmm. English, mm-hmm. Um, trying to say what you want to say clearly and directly without, uh, without interference and without, uh, you know, learning that uh, for me, if... It, 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 there's a false. This is this is the cartoonist training too. 
the best compliment you can give for a cartoon is that it's so natural. And it took me 15 mm-hmm. years to mm-hmm. learn that, the, mm-hmm. to learn that what is it about the great cartoons? Well, the only thing I can land on is when you see a great cartoon, it, it's not forced. There's no distance between what the cartoonists wanted and, and what they felt and what comes out mm-hmm. on paper. It's kind of like Picasso doing a painting. It's as if he smashed the canvas into his head and, <laughs> and his feeling mm-hmm. and this archaic stuff is right there. Well, the same thing with writing is is how to, how do you tell this story in a way that is, does not seem forced or contrived or false that does not have the detritus of the mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. author all over it, like phony sentences, you know, things that don't ring true, that that seem right. clunky, the wrong word, uh, you know, it, it, in drawing, uh, it any a little line, it, a, a comma in a in a caption can make all the difference in whether something works or not. So you learn to pay attention to all those details and to be and to care about it. Mm-hmm. One of your dearest friends is novelist Pat Conroy, author of The Prince of Ties. Did he have any special advice for you as you began novel writing? You know, we had talked for so long. We, what's interesting about our relationship, we don't talk that often about writing. Uh, but whenever Pat starts talking about it, I always pay attention mm-hmm. because <clears throat> for him, I think his brutal childhood and that mm-hmm. writing for him was his escape and is his kind of secret religion. So, so it's very private for him. He's not an evangelical mm-hmm. like a people <laughs> like a lot of folks. He's it's very personal and private. So, surprisingly, he doesn't talk about that that much. Uh, we talk about sports and all these things. But when he does, I always I always listen. And, and every now and then. Uh, Pat would say things, and and I was always comparing it to the, you know, that's part of our conversation is, uh, you know, things that I know from other art forms and how it how it connects. Uh, Pat uh, took a course from James Dickey, the great mm-hmm, poet, mm-hmm. And, and I remember uh, that it was something that Dickey said that that Pat said once was which is was that the uh, that the words like and as are the two most dangerous words in the English language because if when you s- use them, you're entering the land of cliché and practically everything that follows from this is like that or as, as if something else is it's so hard to be surprising and, and n- fresh. And so he, his admonition to Conroy, which Pat took, is to, to always try to be it's some surprising after using those. And, you know, one of the things I've talked with you about in your work is that there's not a cliche in, in either of your novels. And I was going to ask you how writing The Bridge helped prepare you to write your new novel, Magic Well, time. you know, it's hard to get, if you practice anything, it's hard to get worse at it. So having that practice, having that work, mm-hmm. and seeing that, and, and trying to, learning to cut away the things that don't seem naturally me. you learning, sure. learning more of who you are and what you, you know. I mean, for instance, uh, Conroy has a wonderful voice that I could never would and would never try to emulate or be, be mm-hmm. but that's him and that's who he is and so trying to find out who you are that's what the artist does uh, trying to find out what it is that you do and then do it and and then try to do it with some uh, flair or, or or eloquence mm-hmm. or something uh, directness those are the things that I brought from cartooning uh, pairing away sure. the excess and things that don't. That, that interfere. Um, you know, I think I learned that. I learned, I learned to move, that, uh, how to move things through. These, these are um, the things also you take from playwriting, the forward, keeping the reader's attention. You know, I attribute that to my own lack of, uh, uh, I have the attention span of a hummingbird, and, <laughs> and that maybe is why I do these various things, but I, but I try to keep myself Interested, you know. Uh, if he, uh, if people ask about, are you? What are you trying to accomplish uh, socially or something? I actually, all I'm trying to do with a cartoon or with a novel is to stay awake. <laughs> you know that if you hold a mirror under my nose at the end of a chapter, <laughs> yeah, of writing a chapter, then you will get some little little fog on the mirror, so uh, or a pulse. You know, I want to be stimulated. I want to feel something uh, from drawings and from writing, uh, and so. I try to cut away everything that is boring, you know, that, it, that or that is not doing what you're trying to accomplish. One of the interesting things I learned this from playwriting is it's kind of like chess thinking, like chess. Uh, you have to think dimensionally mm-hmm. on several levels of what you're trying to accomplish. You, you're not just getting somebody in and out of a room, 
but making sure it's serving the story and making sure this is what you just mentioned, avoiding cliches. Mm-hmm. And that, mm-hmm. that t- that's a full-time edit. I mean, that's over oh, and exactly. over again, going back over. Uh, so it's a, you know, it, it's, uh, there's a million ways to go wrong in writing. That's what I've noticed. And so you have to be vigilant. Well, and you're finding all the ways, ways to go right. Tell us about the actual historical incident that informed this novel. Uh, well, with Magic Time, you know, I, I happened, my father was in the military, and I was a, grew up a military brat. We moved from town to town. I ended up in Laurel, Mississippi in the early 60s during the very you know, toughest uh, of the bad times of the civil rights period, except my impression of that was uh, of moving to Mississippi at age 12 was how hot it was and how nice everybody was. And mm-hmm. so I took that childhood memory and then, uh, interestingly, down the street from the, my house and the Baptist church that I went to was a little coffee shop where there was a man I would see occasionally sitting there with his cronies smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and his name was Sam Bowers. And it, rumor was that he, he was the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I learned years later is that he had single-handedly been responsible for some of the most brutal violence, the beatings, the church mm-hmm. bombings, the the uh, deaths of Goodman, Schroeder, and Cheney, uh, the deaths of Vernon Damer. He had ordered mm-hmm. personally. And it was odd to me that that you would I would that would be someone in my life. Oh, of course. And and so so I, Magic Time is kind of a love story. I mean, I'm not really interested in writing um, uh, historical fiction in the sense. I, I mean, I think mm-hmm. that the nonfiction has done a wonderful job with the civil rights era. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I am interested in how these things affect uh, when history goes on and how we're unaware of it and mm-hmm. how, how it impinges on people's lives. I think of, of Magic Time the way, say, Casablanca is a love story set against World War II. And that, yes. uh, or The Sound of Music is this love story set against the rise of Nazi Germany. Exactly. But, uh, it's, but it's, it's really about the human, uh, about... Uh, Love really, and and how that can survive these great traumas that people. I was also w- was was just interested. I told my father when I was researching the novel, when I was taking my son on uh, when he was in high school on a tour of Mississippi and the Deep South. Uh, I called it a blues civil rights tour. Mm-hmm. I was going to take him to see Highway 61 in the Delta of Mississippi, sure. but also the Lorraine Ho- Hotel where Dr. King was murdered and then down in Laurel where I live. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I told my father that I was going back there. He said, why? And I said, well, I'm writing a novel that's set during Freedom Summer. I said, do you remember 1964 mm-hmm. when we lived in Mississippi? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I said, do you remember the deaths of Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney? My 82-year-old father said, oh, yeah, I was involved in the search for their bodies. Mm-hmm. Now, I had no idea of that, that my father had been involved with the search for the bodies, which is, that is one of the great historic moments mm-hmm. in American history and there's my father involved in it. reminds me with the bridge which was written when I learned that close to the age of 40 that my grandmother had been banned by National Guardsmen during probably the most important unknown event in American history the uprising in 1934 the, the mill strike the cotton mill strike <clears throat> so you begin seeing or I see that you know uh, my family's kind of like Forrest Gump. I mean, we're, the, you know, we're kind of at the crosshairs of history, but there's a kind of an obliviousness to it that there's not an awareness. How could I not know that? And it, this would be these would be events that would be so important to me mm-hmm. that I would be mm-hmm. writing a novel about it, and I would not know that my father had been involved in the search for the bodies of, of those three civil rights workers. That interests me, and it may be in my genes, and so it's almost like this kind of detective work of how uh, history and our personal lives intersect and we always think of it as over there on the TV screen or in the headlines right. having nothing to do with us and yet we're right in the middle of it. So there, my family has this kind of gumpy and obliviousness and, and I, but I think that's the way we all are and it's kind of uh, that we, uh, you know, the, it raises the question if apartheid falls in the middle of a forest with a forest of marlettes around, <laughs> will anyone notice or does it make a sound? So. And Magic Time is dedicated to your dad, and he's since passed away. I bet you're especially pleased that you got to, to give this book to him. Yeah, before, I'm before very, uh, I'm very happy of, about that. And you know, and, and I think the central relationship, although 
the central relationship is the father-son relationship with uh, Carter Ransom and his father, the judge. Uh, but also, as I said, that, you know, when I look back, I was surprised to see that there were four love interests for the character. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not even a book about Mormons. But, but, there, <laughs> but, there is a, but, there, but Car- because one of the things you can do in fiction that you can't do in nonfiction is that you can show the passage of time. And so exactly. I, I take this character from his young manhood into his dotage or his middle age. And, and during that time, he has several relationships with females. And, uh, so it's, it is a love story. In that way. And you actually use parallel time frames in a way. We have the past and, and the present together. And we're not talking just flashbacks with the past. You really have extended narrative. Why is that the best way to tell this story? Well, I'm not sure. It's the only way I knew how to tell the story. So I'm not sure. Uh, and so I tried to, to do that in a way that was not obtrusive or not, uh, you know, like using italic for the past. And, and mm-hmm. all of that seems mm-hmm. obtrusive. So you try to figure out how to do it naturally, but it, you know it kind of gets at at the the old Faulknerian quote about the the past not being over and done. It's not even past. That that there's something in the South, and and see, I believe that the South is is America. That it, it, we tend to look at it as as this weird part of the country that endured, you know, that you know experienced slavery and the sin of slavery and. And invasion and defeat, and that's why, as Walker Percy said, that there are so many writers <laughs> because we had lost, as he mm-hmm. said, we we got beat. Uh, but also, I think it really is the soul of America is in the South, mm-hmm. and the Southeast, that lower right hand corner of the United States. So, something about it is where America comes into itself. From the Civil War, we became most of those battles were fought in the South, and that's where we came into ourselves as a nation and in the civil rights movements where we extended the promise of the founding fathers to all citizens uh, and there's just something about it uh, you know it's why all the great music comes from the south I think it's the south is the soul of America and it's where we act out our problems most vividly our poverty our poverty of the spirit our you know our uh, our struggles so we come into ourselves uh, we become, it's where America discovers its deepest convictions. So I think I'm just kind of faded as a Southerner to kind of tell those stories. Yeah, and, and again, you do it so well, and you're getting the reviews to prove it. A starred review in Kirkus, not many people come by, <laughs> by those. You mentioned the music in the South. What is significant enough about the blues joint in the story to give it title status, magic title? Well, that's interesting. I, I, I'm not sure that I started with that idea that I would, but you know, I saw a, a blues joint, a, a book of pictures. I'm very visually oriented. I get a lot from photographs of people and things, and I saw a... a, a a book, a coffee table book about blues joints, and I had seen a picture, one called Magic Time. I thought that was a great name for a blues joint. Mm -hmm. I I named the joint where the civil rights workers, the SNCC kids, who I've always, you see, again, I follow the emotion or the fire. When I'm writing, Mm -hmm. I I Mm -hmm. want to write things that move me, that I feel something about. And, And I have always been moved by those kids in their bravery and, and incredible courage. Uh, John Lewis and Diane Nash, the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, how they could have done that, what they did, and be so young and to know and to be kind of caught up in this Gandhian vision in the rural South. Where did that come from? How does that happen? That's the surprise in history is the thing I'm after. That's the surprise of literature. I mean, mm-hmm. what you do in a cartoon is you want surprise. So I'm always alert to what you don't expect, you know. And so who would have expected that these uh, these uh, rural k- mm-hmm. black kids would kind of have that kind of moral insight and that they would, I believe, saved America from race wars uh, by their commitment to nonviolence and the Gandhian vision, the Satyagraha. I've always been moved by that. I wanted, but I also noticed that people don't really know that they did that, and and especially the, as the generations pass, even young black kids don't know the sacrifice that went on. And so I wanted to see if I could bring that back to life. I wanted. I'm I'm interested in how things become cliches and become. It's that Walker Percy talks about the Grand Canyon. We can never see it again the way the first explorers saw it because it's become a postcard. And there's something embalming about that. And that's what we do in our minds. Human beings tend to embalm things, and things become cliches, and you never can experience it again Mm -hmm. or know it. What I wanted to do in Magic Time was to look at that time, which seems magical to me, Mm -hmm. and see if I could resurrect it, you know, bring it back to life. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and write about it in a way that would be fresh and new as if it had never happened. It's very hard to write about things that everybody thinks they know about. Uh, mm-hmm. They know about the Ku Klux Klan. They know, all of that's become a cliche. It's become an icon that we all kind of think we know. And so the, the challenge in writing this book was to go into it and bring it back to life. You mentioned the father-son relationship in the book and, and related that to your own experience to, to a degree with your dad. How closely do you identify with your protagonist, Carter? You know, it's funny. I, I do in, in some ways, but also in my first novel, uh, Pitt Cantrell came from Cotton Mill, uh, Lint His, people mm-hmm. that I come mm-hmm. from, which is a, that uh, Carter Ransom is more upscale and more privileged than my background, but I have watched that and seen that I have lots of friends mm-hmm. that, that had that, and it, and it fascinates me of those kind of relationships. Uh, I, I don't, uh, in some ways, I identify with Carter. He's a, you know, he's a lot more, you know, after in the, after the bridge, there was an uh, uproar among uh, some writers about the autobiographical kind sure. of So part of the challenge in, <laughs> in Magic Time was to see if I could write a character who was of such uh, savoir faire and no blessed of blues that nobody would ever think it was me. <laughs> so I wanted to see if I could create a character that was a little was a little different from myself. Who were some of the other characters that you had a special bond with in the novel? In the, well, I think Lige is, is based on my feeling for John Lewis, who, who was yeah. a congressman out of Georgia, and I met him in, when I lived in Atlanta. He was my congressman, and uh, he, uh, he inspired me. Those kids inspired me when I was a kid. Uh, but, they, you know, we were, it's so totally different worlds. Um, one of the challenges is to create women who are unique. Mm-hmm. I have four very strong women characters, mm-hmm. and I wanted to make all of them individuals. A lot of times writers, male writers, will exactly. everyone sounds alike. Exactly. That, that can be even the male characters. They all sound right. So, so the trick uh, to, to have all of the black characters be individuals the temptation when writing black characters, especially for a, a southern liberal, guilt-ridden uh, southern type, is, is to write plaster saints or these kind of dignified, you know, heroic figures. And I wanted them to be human and not, uh, you know, maybe my training in cartooning uh, is I'm kind of constitutionally incapable of creating characters without warts. Mm-hmm. But I, mm-hmm. but I wanted them not to be what Spike Lee calls magical Negroes mm-hmm. who solve all the white peoples. It's another form mm-hmm. of slavery. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rednecks, the the, the people, the, the 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 lower class uh, clansmen, uh, you know, we want to kind of put them in one, make them villainous. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was villainy there, but also I wanted to people to understand them and to see them. I wanted the character of Sam Bohannon, who was this uh, evil man, but I wanted him to s- seem uh, to be real and mm-hmm. to for people to identify with him. Was there a pivotal scene in the book? I don't want you to give too much of the plot away, but a pivotal scene that became a defining moment for several of your characters. Yeah, you mean with the uh, at the naked tail? Yes. The, uh, the scene yes. 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 Um, well, you know, all of this. The judge, the father, Carter's father, was probably inspired by uh, Judge McMillan in Charlotte, who I knew as a young man, who was one of the mm-hmm. great federal judges who ruled on the mm-hmm. the Swan decision, the famous. But I used to spend time around him, listen to him. He told a story in his bi- biographical uh, profile of. of of swimming at a place called Naked Tail in Eastern North Carolina, and it's because all the black kids yeah. and white kids yeah. swam naked together when they were kids, little farm kids, and and I always thought that was a great thing. I, the Naked Tail scene brought all, and, and it captured. I wanted to capture the terror that you could feel. That that uh, I remember my brother saying to me that that terrified him reading that, and I thought, mm-hmm. okay, that's that, that's good. That. Uh, 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 to show what it felt like to be terrorized, one of the motivations for this was 9-11, really, uh, is when I, I recognized when the Twin Towers fell that morning, my deepest resonance with that event was the way it felt when I was a kid, seeing the Palestinians celebrating the, t- the falling of the towers in, uh, you know, in... Uh, uh, in the Middle East and uh, Tel Aviv and, and Amman and all those places. It reminded me of the kids in my classroom in the ninth grade celebrating when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Mm-hmm. And that kind of, and, and I realized that my people were like that, the kind of southern, um, um, lower class, resentful cultures of resentment, and, and that's what was going on. 
but at that time, the only people who worried about terror were black people. And, uh, mm -hmm. and they were being terrorized. The night Riders, people who had wore hoods, just like that's what the, the Al-Qaeda reminded me of the Ku Klux Klan. So that was the association. That was part of what brought me from the present day back then. The only difference is now the fear of terror has been extended to all Americans, not just black Americans. And I wanted to see if I could connect those things. The, the magic time begins with the bombing of a museum in New York City mm -hmm. by, by uh, terrorists. And it, it throws Carter into his breakdown, his memory of losing his girlfriend. That's why that double time frame works so beautifully to emphasize those points and, and draw them together. Doug, we just have a couple of minutes left here. What can we learn about you from, from reading this book? I know you like Thomas Wolfe. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> that comes through very clearly. What else do we learn about you from this book? You know, I'm not, you know maybe the things we're talking about, uh, uh, my uh, fascination with, with that time, I was always interested in how the decency and kindness of white Southerners like myself could li could go on. I'm always interested in the good German phenomenon of mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. good and decent people can turn their eyes, avert their gaze from the evil uh, amongst them and how we do that. It's a human tendency and I wanted to kind of show that. Uh, um, you know, I always identified with the SNCC kids. Not that they had much braver than I ever could be, and there was no way that someone like myself uh, could have been involved. I wanted to write that, but I think of cartoons as serving the same purpose, and novels as serving the same purpose of uh, being an act of nonviolent direct action. Uh, it would that people wrote more novels and cartoons rather than uh, turn it to violence, but, but, but I always thought that kind of disruptive aspect, the kind of poetry of what they did when they sat in, when they freedom rides, when they did that, created that kind of creative tension that that, uh, that that brings the evil to the surface and that highlights those things. I think that's one of the roles of the cartoonist and the novelist. Well, it's a beautiful book. Congratulations thank on it so and much. all the wonderful things you're doing. Thanks for being here, Doug. Delighted. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.